Hello and welcome to Newspeak. I'm Peter Whittle and as usual, very, very pleased to be joined by Rafe Hadelman Koo, our senior fellow and historian or commentator, and Amy Gallagher, who is the STP candidate for the Mayoralty of London, as well as the woman behind Stand Up to Woke. Um, however, before we start uh, discussing the events of the week, just a few notes for you. First and foremost, our national conference, uh, which is on Saturday, April the 20th, um, promises to be excellent. All your favourite people are going to be there and speaking. Um, we also have David Starkey, Richard Tice, a number of other people. Um, and the title of it this year is State of Emergency. I don't think you will disagree with that when it comes to talking about our country. Anyway, that's the 20th of April. Um, and if you would like to come to that, there are still some tickets. So basically go to the link under this video or indeed just go to our website newcultureforum.org.uk uh, 20th of April, uh, so uh, it should be a great day. Uh, also, we have some local events, you know, our locals are, you know, burgeoning all over the country, I'm pleased to say. Um, and in April, we have a whole number of them coming up, but I'm just going to highlight three here, and I need my phone for this. Um, so basically, on, first of all, in April, on the 9th of April, we have an event in Manchester. So if you're in Manchester, you might be interested to go to that one. Uh, and then on the 17th of April, we have events in Carlisle and Beaconsfield. Carlisle and Beaconsfield. Um, so if you would like to go to either one of those, if you're in the areas, particular areas, then just please do go to locals at newcultureforum.org.uk and we will happily give you the venues and the time. Uh, obviously these are in the evening, and they are free um, and they are proving to be very popular okay um first things first uh it wasn't that long ago amy <laughs> that we were all out on the street or most of us were out on the street clapping the nhs right yeah uh, this is where you've worked obviously for years yeah. as well uh but apparently according to report this week our confidence in it is at an all-time low or very low point. Yeah, that's right. There's a recent survey that showed actually satisfaction rates within pa your patients in the NHS is the lowest it's actually ever been. Um, less than a quarter of people report being satisfied with the NHS. I think they've been taking surveys for this for over 40 years and it's the lowest it's ever been. Um, I think, you know, uh, people have cited the fact that they're on, that they're waiting for GP appointments and they can't get GP appointments. That's one of the reasons they're, they're dissatisfied. But also we know 7.5 million people are on waiting lists for routine appointments. Um, that's increased dramatically since the COVID, since the COVID years where before pre-pandemic years, it was about 3 million people were waiting for routine appointments. So that's more than doubled. Mm. Um, so as you, I mean, as you say, I, I also I think there's just a general resentment about the fact that for two years we were made, we were told that the NHS is everything, you know, give up your freedom, give up your life to save the NHS. Mm. The NHS was, it became a sort of national religion and you could not criticise the NHS, you couldn't criticise doctors or nurses or the, or the service in general. Yeah. And actually we're now in a situation where most people are feeling absolutely let down by the NHS in all sorts of ways. We also know that cancer treatment, um, cancer survival rates have, have dipped significantly. We used to be one of the world leaders for cancer, cancer survival mm. rates. And now actually in terms of the Anglosphere among the wealthy countries, we're, we're lagging behind. We're behind Australia, behind uh, Canada, we're behind Norway. Um, and there's a huge backlog of people waiting for cancer treatment. Um, so this is, you know, you know, I think I think the national religion of the NHS is I think people are starting to feel tired of that now. I think even people that used to, you know, clap for the NHS, as it were, are feeling, you know, actually this this system is not working anymore. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. And there's a lot of unfairness as well in the NHS. So you think it's justified to you, this lack of Yes. Time? Yeah. The lack of the. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen I mean, something that I speak about a lot, but kind of the impact of politics and ideology mm. on the NHS we've seen in terms of there's over 10,000 roles in, within the NHS that are related to diversity, equity, inclusion. The, the NHS spends loads of money on this. It's also spending more and more money on, on, on kind of net zero policies, trying to make ambulances mm. um, electric and so on. 
I mean, if you wanted to make the NHS truly net zero, you'd have to essentially rebuild the whole thing. I mean, hundreds of millions of pounds being spent on this. Um, as someone working in the NHS, you know, I see how we get, you know, services get given a budget of, of a certain amount of money to spend, but they're told that, you know, after a certain amount of time, six months or a year, they won't have that money. So they spend it very quickly and unthinkingly on, usually on tech, but they don't invest it into, you know, staff and, and, and keeping, holding down staff. So there's a high turnover of staff in the NHS. Most staff report feeling undervalued. Um, and... As I said, it's increasingly politicised, and and of course, it's it's ha- experiencing the effects of mass immigration as well. Um, you know, I think now because I don't don't know if it'd be even fair to call it a national health service; it's more like an international health mm. service, mm. in that we have you know expends hundreds of millions of pounds on on health tourists, people that come to this country just to use the NHS and then go and overseas visitors as well. So, and of course, the effect of that is that the burden is placed on the taxpayer, the people that have lived to all their lives and put that money in. I think a lot of people now across the political spectrum are feeling a huge amount of resentment towards our NHS. It, yeah, although at the same time in this survey, it said um, nine out of 10 people wish it were not the case they they are very pro nhs they're pro the idea of the nhs the institution well the idea of the nhs is perfectly sound you know and i i still believe very strongly in this whole concept of the, the very essence being free at the point of service and i think that's you know that's a laudable aim and uh, for, for any institution to have in the public health system but this blind devotion this sort of the, the religious zeal with which uh, people are de- devoted to this so, you know i mean the most absurd example being in the 2012 london olympics when you had a whole section devoted to the nhs to the bewilderment of people around the world because for some reason in this country we've thought for decades that the whole world looks upon us with with envy for our nhs which simply isn't the case it's no longer fit for purpose for all the reasons that amy has said not to mention the fact that we're training our brightest and best doctors who then go and leave to other countries uh, in America and Canada and elsewhere where they can earn far more money. And instead of that, we're importing into this country doctors, depriving their home countries of doctors, but also importing here doctors who aren't trained to the same standards mm-hmm. as our own doctors are. But then when you do get a GP, you never know each time you go whether you'll have the same GP again. All of the, These are the reasons people have dissatisfaction because that sort of level of care has decreased hugely look we need to have a root and branch reform of the nhs and uh, i think that includes possibly looking at the way that it's funded now whenever you try to discuss funding of the nhs people immediately think you're trying to turn us into an american style system the very best healthcare systems in the world with a couple of exceptions all have a portion of private health insurance or national health insurance being incorporated there yeah. singapore japan korea germany switzerland norway sweden these are the world's most successful healthcare systems producing the best outcomes and as much as we're devoted to the ideology of the nhs being a, a publicly funded thing i think outcomes must be far more mm. in, important and relevant we actually pay rather less than we should be paying we pay about 20 percent less uh, for healthcare than than in other countries. So if you really do want to have uh, a proper healthcare system that actually does uh, have an ability to to deal with things like cancer and so forth, we will have to pay for it, but not in the current model because we know how much waste there is. We need we need to be willing to pay more, but we need to have a sensible discussion about having the p- actual private individual contribute to that directly. In Japan, they pay 30%, the, na- the nation pays 70%. In Singapore, you pay 10% of your salary every month goes into this. Mm-hmm. There are all sorts of options there that we should be able to openly discuss. And for some reason, no politician is willing to have those discussions. Well, particularly the Tories, actually, because, I mean, they're always on the hook, aren't they? Oh, they, you know, they're basically wanting to privatise. It's absolute rubbish, actually. Look, I'm not standing up for the Tory party here, but, I mean, in terms of money, they have ploughed money in, as we know, um, to it. It is a kind of, as you say, a structural structural thing. Um, I noticed, well, that Jeremy Hunt, in his speech, uh, his uh, budget speech, said that this was our greatest treasure, didn't he? Well, I'm sorry, but, I mean, 
you know, we're not just a country. It's like a, an NHS with a country attached, if we're not careful, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think the Tories, they try, I think they've championed the NHS so much in an attempt to get away from the idea of them being the nasty party or the party mm. of privatisation. They've put so much money into the NHS over the last 10 and 14 years. Um, it's a complete myth that uh, the NH that there's been cuts to the NHS. More, while there may have been cuts to certain services, overall, the money going into the NHS has gone up and up and up. Mm -hmm. um, so much money is being put into it. And that money is not... The, the point is, is that the increasing the amount of money going into the NHS doesn't improve things because it's how the money is being spent. It's often being spent on more management, more bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. As a nurse, you know, I'm on the front line. I felt often felt that I'm like a bureaucrat first and the nurse second. I have to do all of this form filling in and ticking all these boxes so I can actually just see a patient. And even then I'm sort of thinking about all the things I've got to do. Um, so much money has been, you know, put into the wrong things in the NHS. It's the management of it that needs to change. It's the structure. It needs actually ploughing more and more money into it isn't going to help. Um, and I think that's that's the real issue here. Mm. I think it's just, it's... Uh the case in France, I think, and possibly Germany, you can tell me from what, that, that people pay a nominal amount when they even have an appointment. Mm. So, you know, for example, quite you know, the number of people who don't turn up here is, is huge. I mean, so I remember sitting in my, uh, you know, where the doctor's waiting room was, NHS, and there was a sign saying, you know, 200 appointments missed or whatever uh, this month, uh, this cost us such and such. And you sort of think, you know, what is so wrong about just a fiver or something like that, you know, just to go and see, you know, as a, as a one off charge when you're there? Because I mean, also maybe it will cut down on what you might call people who are frivolous about going. Yeah, you but know? I think people use and abuse the NHS as much as they like because there's no, as you say, no repercussions for not turning mm. up for an appointment. Mm. And I think people have a lot of resentment towards the NHS. So they just think, you know, I've seen it myself, lots of, pa as, as you say, lots of patients don't turn up for appointments and. Um, staff often bend over backwards to try to, to yeah. you know, reach out to them, and there's no there's no in, there's no incentive to how much you use or or don't use the NHS or how much you treat or how you treat it. Mm -hmm. um, and as as I said, you know, health tourism and, and people coming in who haven't even paid into the system are also doing that, also using it for their own gain. I, I think when you uh, you said. Uh, hundreds of millions in what we call health tourism that might even be understating it i seem to remember some figure of two billion or something that crazy. that's for overseas visitors yeah, yeah so people that have been here not very long mm. and maybe they've been here a year or so but they certainly haven't spent their adult life putting into the, the mm. system mm. by you know this, it's ridiculous this uh politicization of it as well I mean, there have been a few cases of there not recently. In fact, there was one that was in the paper this morning about some young kid, Jewish kid, who was basically just left, you know, and he wasn't given the kind of care he should have been. And also nurses wearing these free Palestine badges and things. I mean, is that something you recognise in your experience, you know? I can't say that I, I've experienced that sort of thing directly, but certainly you can just tell from the demographics within the NHS mm. that those issues are going to arise because, yeah. you know, people don't leave their politics at home no matter how much they try, you know, to a degree that's going to that that's going to be be present. But yes, you know, other countries don't seem to have the same issue with, with tourism, in the NHS mm. tourism that we do. You know, countries like Singapore, etc., you will pay 100% of the costs if you don't have uh, national health insurance, mm. for example. Um, you know, and, and so there are lots of ways that other countries are able to deal with this. Um, I don't like charging people for doctor's appointments. I think people should be fined if they don't attend their doctor's appointment. I don't want people not to go for an appointment because of the financial aspect. But if they don't turn up, then if I think their next appointment they should pay for, or there should be a fine of some sort. But I just think the whole structure needs to be changed so that situation doesn't arrive if people are actually obliged to have a portion of their income go towards the NHS where they can actually see it or even just have a hypothecated tax where you can actually see you know, I think we spend about 18 percent of our income tax goes to the NHS if people can actually see that and clearly you know they realize the cost that this is uh, then I think there's there'll be people that will realize how important it is actually to show up for these things mm. I would say it's an important point about you know other countries because it's always said is it oh do you want to be like America do you really want that? You know, where they, they won't even treat you unless you've got insurance. A lot of that is a myth, actually. In fact, the strange thing about America is it is harsh 
the private uh, scheme until you get 65 and then it can be very good with Medicare uh, interestingly enough so if you can hang on that long well and the important thing to know most of the, of the best countries around the world uh, which have obligatory national health insurance to cover essential things they everyone gets it irrespective of their age or of their health conditions they all pay the same fee mm. so it's not as if the fact if you are 70 years old and you've got some predisposition towards cancer you'll pay more than an 18 year old who's fit and healthy and i think people have to understand and also we're not talking about huge sums of money either so i think there are a lot of myths that exist around the idea of of uh, health insurance which we need to actually be able to discuss and the explode yeah. As you say, though, I mean, I think it was Nigel Lawson who said that the NHS is the nearest Britain has to a national religion now. Mm. And it is sort of, it's, it's part also, is it not, of the kind of culture in which we're living now, which is just absolutely, you know, it's to do with care, and it's to do, isn't it, with, mm. with, with, with illness. And it's a, somehow this is the most precious thing yeah i mean it's a there's a lot of entitlement in the way that people use the nhs mm. and a lot of kind of safetyism i think mm. we saw that in covid safetyism, yeah. and it overlaps with the kind of woke agenda i, I think you know you see I, I think you know the politicization of the nhs is happening more and more often we're seeing like, people wearing lanyards with um you know black lives matter and lgbt mm. and it, it there is a kind of overlap as you say with the kind of ethos of of victimhood yes I guess. yes uh, and yes. um you know, championing people that are, you know, you know, have problems and, and elevating their problems and making it the most important thing about them and, and making it all about our needs and our health and um, self-care and, and, and so on. I think there is there is something going on. I think the one way of good of, way of, of, of um, illustrating this politicization is that if somebody did come in and say, right, we're going to we're going to seriously try and reduce health tourism, for example, or bring a law in or something like that, you can almost be sure that the people in the NHS themselves would not administer it. They would just say, no, we're not doing that. We are absolutely not. They would simply would, would not administer the law. I mean, there's a lot of similarity between the the, um, the takeover of, of um, the, our medical system, as we've seen in education, mm -hmm. where there's been a huge swing to the, to the, to the left amongst teachers. The same thing has happened in the nursing profession. Mm -hmm. To a, to a lesser degree amongst doctors, but still overwhelmingly left-wing too. And of course, they all subscribe to the notion of open borders to some degree or another. And part of that includes being able to treat people wherever they come from. Yeah, and well, speaking of open, open borders, which we very rarely do on this show, <laughs> um, uh, very interesting, uh, some statistics, some data issues this week, Rafe. Um, well, they, they seem unrelated, but the thing that seems to me to connect them is that now that people are being a little more open about talking about migration they're trying to find out things uh, the state of play when it comes to data is actually become coming up now into the daylight isn't it i mean with it, can you explain what what it is particularly neil o'brien that's right so neil o'brien the tory mp former minister has written a piece essentially showing how information about the nationality of people uh, is being deleted from the, you know, the Office of National Statistics and so forth. So it, it's more, you can't find out now who, uh, what nationalities are paying the most or the least tax. Mm -hmm. You can't find out which nationalities living in this country um, and can receive the most benefits or the fewest benefits, or indeed when it comes to sort of uh, conv convictions or crimes, which nationalities commit the most and the least crimes. And um, this information is being denied to the to the British people, and you would think surely more information, the more information, the better. You know, if you want just to decide which countries are the best to encourage migration from or reduce migration from, if you're dealing with things like in, like health tourism, for example, things like that, well, one of the reasons we were able to introduce the National Health Service charge on foreigners coming over here is precisely because we could see before which nationalities were actually using the NHS yes. and so you were able to determine all of these things. This comes at the same time as uh, Nigel Farage and GB News have begun a campaign about trying to identify the nationality of, uh, of um, sex crime attacks in this country, particularly in relation to those who are asylum seekers in this country, because that information is held by the Ministry of Justice, but they refuse, they've refused the Freedom of Information request to, to, to publish all of this. Meanwhile, in Denmark, 
they do have this information and it's very mm. telling to see it's precisely as one would expect in terms of in terms of being a drain on the economy uh, migrants coming from North Africa and the Middle East, uh, you know, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan are the biggest drains on the economy, whereas immigration from Western Europe, America and India are the biggest contributors to the, to the, to the Dutch economy. Now, those are important things mm. to know, and yet we are being denied that sort of information here. Mm. We, do know, uh, we, we do know the nationality of prisoners, but we don't know the nationality of what crimes they've committed. All that we have in this country to help us determine these things is ethnicity. Mm. But it's such a broad... A broad um, yes. They, they, they describe Asians, for example. Now, that includes everyone from someone from Japan to someone from Pakistan, mm -hmm. two completely different types of migrant that are coming to this country. But what we do know is that, for example, whilst immigrants uh, make up 12, ethnic minorities make up 13% of the population, they account for 27% of the convictions for crimes in this country. Now, but that needs further analysis to break down precisely what's happening, and we're being denied that. Yes, I mean, we're, we're actually, the NCF, going to be doing uh, some serious research on this, actually, and, and we'll produce a publication about it. Because, as you say, uh, you mentioned in Holland, they, 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 that was strictly about economics, was it? Denmark, yeah. Uh, de uh, right, okay. But the what you were uh, mentioned there with the um, the crime statistics that, that I saw that Nigel actually tweeted out that's Denmark, isn't it? And then basically it's quite extraordinary, or or rather maybe not, depending on your view. But you've got the, this huge number at the top, and for, for some reason Kuwaitis in 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 well, there are lots of refugees from Kuwait Denmark, going yeah. going to Denmark. And what's interesting is that they've also done graphs to show, uh, as a proportion of the population or relative to the native population, uh, which immigrants commit, which groups commit most crimes and if you, violent crimes. And if you look at Danes and Western immigrants, they have approximately the same level of homicides, violent crime, and rape. Mm. Um, but when it comes to non-Western immigrants in Denmark the violent crime and homicide rate is three times higher than it is for the native population. Mm -hmm. And when you get to rape, it's more than seven times higher mm -hmm. amongst non-Western immigrants to Denmark. And of course, you know, there's no reason to assume that you wouldn't find similar, similar statistics mm -hmm. for other Western European nations, or indeed the situation here in this country. All that we really do know is that in this country, um, you know, black people make up 4% of the population, but they're 9% of the prison population. Uh, Asians make up 9% of the population, but they are about 8 or 7% of the prison population. Whites are 83% of the population, but only 79% of the prison population. But even there, we just, we're just told about whites. We don't have white British as a standalone group. Yeah, yeah. That will include Albanians, that will include Romanians, oh, and so forth. Mm. Mm. Yes, it's a little bit like uh, uh, these statistics that came out quite recently about Bristol, I think. And it was the rate of rape and violent attack um, had just rocketed in the past few years. Mm -hmm. I mean, just gone up a treble by 300%. Mm -hmm. And so you, one wants to find out why this is, whilst at the same time looking at it, and some things seem, you know, to be quite clear. I mean, you know, this is a period of time of mass. Migrate. Yeah, the same is true as for London as well, that sexual assault and sexual crimes have gone up in London. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that's in the era of mass immigration, which London has experienced heavily. Um, and generally, you know, Sadiq Khan and generally the, the, the kind of establishment position on this is just, it's, it's a toxic, it's toxic masculinity or it's men, but they don't want to break down which, which sort of men. Um, I think there's similar statistics for Sweden as well, uh, where the, if you break down crimes, actually Swedish people are very, very low. And actually it's a lot of the, the people that they've that yes. come into the country that are, uh, you know, recently that are committing crimes. I think it's really interesting because we're, we're living in an era that's obsessed with race and nationality and identity as a whole. Um, we see so many, often where headlines about certain crimes, where the race will be in, in the headline, and yet in other crimes it's not. And we have this almost complete contradiction in our society at the moment where we're saying race and nationality and identity is everything, and then at the same time we're, we're burying it. We don't want to look at it. Mm. Well, either it's, it, it, it's important or it's not. We have to decide. And if it's important, then there should be no area in which statistics are, are, are not looked at or, or nationality isn't considered. Well, it's important it's insofar as it helps the narrative of uh, 
yeah. you know, what is positive. I mean, with these, uh, with Neil O'Brien's piece about revenue, tax revenue, and that amount of benefits, I mean, the obvious seems, seems to me is that they're covering something up. I mean, you know, if you, if you decide not to print this anymore, not to keep it anymore, so that you can avoid, uh, you know, freedom of information requests, um, why would you do that? Why would you suddenly do that? Is it because actually, you know, facts go against what you want to argue? That's exactly right. It exp all of this explodes the myth that diversity is our greatest strength. Mm. It's impossible to stand on a platform and argue that mm. when you have the statistics clearly showing the opposite to be the case. And in terms of Neil O'Brien, when he did request this information, you know, being a f um, an MP, he had to get a formal reply. And they said that the reason that we're not doing publishing nationality data is that the reasons for first compiling this are no longer relevant. Well, that's another way of saying, actually, this is causing more harm than good to mm. this image mm. of, so, you know, the, mm. and the idea of social cohesion that we're, that we're creating. And I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's something which is only going to make people feel more dis untrusting of, of institutions. Mm. Mm. They're going to know something is afoot rather than being able to come clean so we can actually deal with this very it growing issue mm. and it's only going to grow greater as we see far larger numbers of people coming to this country and, I mean for example you know Muslims are seven percent of the population of this country they are 18 percent of the of the prison population Hindus who are about two percent of the population are, are less than one percent of the yeah. prison population yeah. now those are the sorts of things you need to be able to discuss when you are looking at immigration and all these sorts of issues mm. 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 All this is going to also become more relevant because there was a piece uh, by one Stephen Davis, who's an historian, in the Telegraph. He was actually commenting on a report in the Lancet, which was reported on a bit, uh, but from a different angle. But the, the, the thrust of what he's saying is that there is the most uh, catastrophic um, decline in the birth rate worldwide, mm -hmm. right? But also this is leading to population um, movement, you know, obviously, um, which we've covered on this show before because there was a great book actually called Youthquake, which was done by Ed Pace, and he was sort of concentrating on sub Saharan Africa. But I mean, this particular piece by Stephen Davis um, was always saying that, well, for example, Europe's had it, forget it. Yeah, well, Europe is the old is the oldest continent, is the oldest continent, and they say it may lose half of its population by the end of the century. Uh, average age in Europe is about forty three years of age. Mm -hmm. Japan's the worst at 49, 49 years of age, and the doomsayers here say, "Oh, well, this is going to be a huge calamity for Europe and for the, and for the world." because you're going to basically have no economic growth, you're going to have a stagnant society, there'll be no young people to innovate and develop develop our civilization and so forth. Uh, but I think actually a lot of this is quite is overly pessimistic because, you know, a, a population decline of two or three million will just take us back to where we were when I was young, actually, or even when I was in my teenage years. Um, innovation, all right. So if we don't get that much innovation, life was fine in the 1990s. You know, the last 30 years we have a lot of innovation, but there's no reason that we we need to increase innovation exponentially as we have. You know, the last 300 years since the Industrial Revolution have been an abnormal period in in world mm. civilization. Mm. Um, we before that we grew at a very at a much slower pace. If we need to dial down all of that, I don't see what the problem with that is. A lower population will also mean house prices will be cheaper, for example. Do you know? <laughs> there, there, are also, well, there are all sorts of relevant issues here. Also, I think very importantly, this is happening at the same time as we are having the AI and robotics revolution, a revolution just as important as the internet or the industrial revolution. So all those sorts of issues that people are talking about, are there won't be enough people in the NHS to staff things? Well, actually, AI and because we're talking about 70 years, to a hundred years mm. from now. Mm. So whilst now, of course, we can't imagine that, in 50 or 70 years, we'll be living in an entirely different universe when it comes to these sorts of things. So many jobs will actually won't exist any longer because of AI and technology. So I think a lot of the doomsayers actually might need to reevaluate re all of this in that context. I think one of the reasons why they're being, you know, doom laden about it, particularly with Europe, is that essentially it will mean almost certainly huge movement of young men from sub-Saharan mm. Africa into Europe, which is we're sort of already seeing in a way, but I mean, it would end on a vast scale. In other words, that 
we might all those things might be true but at the same time the culture of the country will simply not be the same i mean it will be a different continent it will have the same building standing but entirely different people in it i mean i think yeah i think that's the most worrying thing i think it, and, al and also that politicians will use this uh, issue as a reason to justify immigration mm. that obviously we've been told for, for decades now that uh, mass immigration is 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 bringing you know, will improve the economy that's mm. now been disproven so you may well see a political class that shift towards saying well actually we need more people in the country because of our birth rates I think what was potentially positive about this study, if you could give it a positive spin, was that this did show that it's a global thing. I think mm, we in the West mm. often feel that it's it's us. You I know, know I did. Yeah, I do. Mm, mm. That we think you know, everywhere else, China and India and, and mm. uh, Africa are having loads of babies and it's just a Western thing. And we usually cite our individualism or our liberalism as being reasons for that. Whereas actually this is a, a global thing. So it kind of shows you that actually it's not just a Western thing. So I thought that that was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, I think most of us sort of on a day to day basis feel kind of a general concern is that there's too many people. Um, London's, there's about 10 million people living in London now. And generally we feel like resources are scarce. So it's quite hard to take in a study that's kind of raising the alarm about there not being enough people. Mm. But it does seem to be that the direction it will be going in. I think the study showed that um, by the end of the century, it will only be some c countries in Africa where the birth rate's higher than the death rates. But actually, even in the Middle East and yeah. various places, the, the, the birth rate will be going down. So it would, it would change things geopolitically and culturally in a huge way, not just for the West. I yes, think. yes. But that's my point. There's no need for us to be worried about a declining population. <laughs> Immigration is another issue entirely from North mm. Africa and elsewhere, but that's up to governments to stop mm. that. Mm. But you know, if the will is there to stop people coming into this country, we shouldn't be afraid of a decline in population because it actually may lead to an improvement in our, in our lives. You know, fewer NHS waiting lists, more places in schools, as at lower house prices. You know, and again, the, the, the rise of technology dealing with, with all the sort of issues that are problems now. No public, public the taxes we pay to pay public servants dramatically decline. So there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the future as long as we're able to actually stem the migration flows. Yes. Well, that's the big if, isn't it? I mean, I think I agree. It says a report like this was, it's, it's huge. It's worth looking up, by the way, Telegraph, it was in, Stephen Davis. Um, at the same time, it gives this long perspective, doesn't it? So as you say, 300 years has been unusual. So before that, things were much sort of slower. Uh, why would you say though, you know, because when it comes to the West, I, I sort of have all my pat answers as to why, you know, why, oh, well, it's because women don't want to have uh, so many children. There's a general sense of malaise, which I, I think can affect that, and the expense of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I generally think it's when basically people feel there's no real future. Even on a subconscious level, they just stop doing things which are about the future, having children. But it's a worldwide thing. Well, it's because, mm. it's because of capitalism. So the whole purpose of having large families, and that, that applied here in the 19th century and it applied in the 20th century in, in Africa and elsewhere, was because of the high infant mortality rate mm. and the need to have, and the lack of, of a social welfare system, so the dependence upon your children to look after you in your older age. As income levels in, in India and China and elsewhere have increased, there is, there, uh, and society has improved, there's no longer the need to have all of that. And instead of basically spending money across 10 children, mm. people are more willing to spend that money on, on one or two children and give them a much better quality of life and much better mm. chances in life. And also, of course, tied in with that, women around the world are becoming more sort of uh, liberated, if I can use that term, uh, going into the workforce and, and, and all the rest of it. So uh, with all the problems that that in, uh, entails. Mm. And also there's a general decrease in male fertility, which is another big well, problem. No, this, no, one can, no one apparently can still explain this. Mm. You know, the, that it's, it's dropped hugely since, well, I think the Second World War. I think I mean, it's a, one, one percent per year since the nineteen seventies yeah. drop in wealth. What's going on there? I mean, I remember P. D. James wrote a great book in the nineties. She was known as a detective writer, but she wrote something called Children of Men, which was then made into a very good film, actually. But she sort of it was very pressing. Nineteen oh, no one's having kids anymore, and there's this one person who becomes pregnant. Um, I wonder why it should happen. You say capitalism. Mm. 
But I wonder. Also no, but it is a made, it's, it's an accepted fact. People are having yeah. fewer children because children yes. were there to support the parents. That yeah. was the whole purpose. The, the reason for immigration often here is because Europe has the biggest um, uh, public spending, or should we say, social spending of anywhere in the world. So naturally, they come here. You know, it's not for our values. You know, it's it's for this. But of course, when that collapses, as maybe it will do, because mm. there's no money anymore, maybe the, those huge movements will stop. Not necessarily, because we still have better infrastructure and more job opportunities as well. So there may be some of that, but I think just the, 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 the quality of life in, in Europe is far better mm. than in Africa and so forth, where, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's primitive stuff in a lot of places. Mm. Uh, but course, we'll never know that because they're now hiding the stack. They're hiding the stack. <laughs> but another issue in the West is, is the fact that people now have far more isolated existences. Mm -hmm. So in Japan, for example, young men, I think that there's a huge number of men under 40 who are still virgins. And they have cyber girlfriends now, these, these sort of bots, the, the avatars that exist now. Now that's coming over to Europe because, you know, in Europe now, youngsters are having less sex than any point in history. Mm. It's good on the one side, there are far fewer teenage, uh, um, teenage pregnancies, um, but at the same time, that's one of the reasons you're having fewer children as well. So there's a whole bunch of things going on at the same time, I think. Yes. It may also be because we're living in a digital age now where if most people in most countries you know, can access and look at different lifestyles around the globe. Mm. So there's going to be more reasons to not have children or to have other ambitions, whereas ordinarily you'd just have your community and you would look to your family as to how you live your life. Whereas now there's so many kind of infinite opportunities or, or ways of living that people are deciding not to have children. Yes. And, and, and of course, the, the availability of contraception as well. But you see, it's as amazing as it, people still sort of hanker after, you know, the big family. Mm. It's just, it's, they now do it by looking at films and things. You know, I remember, you know, you remember Eat, Pray, Love? It was that Julia Roberts film. That very, I remember that very much. It's very typical of a, of a couple, you know, leading this very, you know, ascetic life, very, very wealthy and everything. But, you know, they wanted, they, they, they gloried in being amongst people and, and amongst the families that they went out to see when they travelled around the world. It's, so people still want that in a way, don't they? Mm. I mean, because just while we're finishing off, it, you know, loneliness, you know, in the West, for the reasons that you said about the atomization, you know, is now an epidemic proportion, actually. That, that in fact, you know, there was a, again a piece in the Times, and the guy was absolutely correct. You know, he was saying oh, rather than look inside yourself all the time. Sorry, I know you're a ther therapeutic <laughs> nurse, but you know, we yes. do wonderful work. But <laughs> apart, apart from that, instead of doing that, actually go out and be with people. Mm. So you know, with this mental health crisis we've got at the moment, uh, you know, that's the very place they should be is going to work. You know, not sitting at home. Yeah. Well, it may well be with this population crisis. I mean, we're going to have an increasing sort of retirement age pensioner uh, demographic mm -hmm. and less people in the workplace. So it may well be an incentive to have a kind of an extended family. We may well be forced into yeah. looking after our elders more because because that's just the way the thing, things land. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, I think, I think with affluence comes more introspection. And yeah. I think that that's a become a kind of sickness in itself. I don't think it's sort of actually hits us quite yet because mm. people of, of, I say our age, I, you know, I'm, I'm far older than you, but I mean, basically people in the 30s, 40s, whatever, they are facing life probably in a, in a residential home. I mean, en masse yeah. in a way that we've never seen before. You know, So you've got that to look for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so haven't we all. Um, thank you very much, Amy and Rafe. Um, and uh, well, look, uh, we ended on a sort of cautiously optimistic note there about the world, which seems yeah. seems appropriate because it's Easter. I do hope you're having a nice weekend, won't you? And um, we enjoy the rest of it. Happy Easter to you. And we shall see you next week. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. 
As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.